Hello and welcome to a new episode here for HNet's H Soul Wars new podcast series on Soul War history books. And we are today coming from the depths of the bayou. Um, you can't see it. I'm actually wearing my Rage and Cajun <laughs> shirt for today. <laughs> and we are down south of New Orleans and Lafitte, Louisiana. <laughs> and joining us is Karen Jose Bell. She is a native of Louisiana, but she's also a professor emeritus from the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Very nice place. A lot of history up there. And she is the author also of Revolution, Romanticism, and the Afro Creole Protest Tradition in Louisiana, 1718 to 1868. And today, we are going to talk with her about Creole New Orleans. The at, in, Sorry. <clears throat> today, we're going to talk with her about Creole New Orleans in the revolutionary Atlantic world, 1775 to 1877, which came out in October of 2023 with Louisiana State University Press. So first of all, thank you so much for taking a little time from Mardi Gras to join me today, Karen. And uh, let's just go right into it. How did you come to write a book, or I should say another book, about New Orleans Creoles and sort of the revolutionary Atlantic region. This book is the culmination of a lifetime of study. In my undergraduate work, I was fascinated by the French Revolution and uh, the American Revolution and civil rights here in Louisiana. And so the book brings those things together. And um, it's been a wonderful education for me. I've learned... <laughs> I've learned so much from writing it, things I, I never dreamed of. So uh, uh, it's been very, very productive study. And one of the things that was very valuable was the French language sources mm -hmm. that are here and elsewhere uh, that I was able to tap and just barely scratch the surface. So it's wonderful in that way that there's so much yet to be done mm. about Louisiana history and uh, uh, New Orleans history. When I was uh, be at the beginning, uh, I read a book by Vincent Harding. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He published a book in 1981. Mm -hmm. And the title of his book was There is a River, The Black Struggle for Freedom in America. And he wrote this in his wonderful book. Um, of course, and this is, uh, he's referring to antebellum New Orleanians, mm -hmm. black New Orleanians. Uh, he's saying, of course, revolutionary change was precisely what was necessary to advance authentic black freedom. Mm -hmm. And nowhere in the South did black people speak more clearly or insist more adamantly on the need for radical post-war change than in New Orleans. And so that's essentially the story that I came to tell. And the, you know, the bringing together the revolutionary era, which was enormous, enormously impactful. Mm -hmm. And uh, that story with New Orleans, the New Orleans story. And so, um, so in France was enormously mm -hmm. important here in France. Yeah. So those three things, Haiti, France, yeah. and the city. Um, so that that's what I ended up with. And I ended up with a lot of surprises too. I had oh, no yeah. I had no idea that the that uh, Haitians have played and continue to play mm -hmm. such an important role uh, in our history. So that was uh, quite an education for me. The first hints came. I don't know how, how long you want me to go on with this. <laughs> uh, like, I would say like, let's kind of go in, and kind of explore some of these subjects as as you kind of because you have you already like 
half of the points that I want to talk in more detail about you're already mentioning. So it's sort of like, oh my gosh, there's so much that you have in your book, which is why uh -huh. I found it so fascinating. Um, but let's talk first about the source material, because I think that that really like, it's the first thing you say in the book. And it's one of the first really kind of important aspects that we have, right? So why do you think previous scholars just didn't pay attention to these French, Francophone, like, materials? Like, why not? Like, it, it's, it, like, for me, I'm looking at it, it's like, it should be a no-brainer that you touch this stuff. It's Louisiana. It's a French former colony. Uh -huh. Well, it's the language barrier, of course. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely the language barrier. And um, ideally, uh, someone who wanted to <clears throat> really dig in more deeply than I did, uh, mm -hmm. Spanish, French, and English uh, are the languages, you know, you would mm -hmm. ideally want to speak. So mm -hmm. it's quite a challenge. And I mean, in recent years, uh, it's gotten worse because uh, language education mm -hmm. uh, has come under considerable uh i mean the, the language departments and so yeah. uh it's not seen in fact it's seen in some areas as being subversive to speak a foreign language huh? yeah yeah but it's, in especially some areas with in certain country. languages yeah. yeah yeah so um given all of that you know i'm i'm not hopeful that things are going to improve in the future mm -hmm. Yeah. But let's let's hope for the best. <laughs> yes. Before the interview, we already talked a bit about the uh, we let our pessimist side out a little bit before right, the right. interview. Right. So, yeah, um, yeah. but it I, I totally agree. Like it, it's graduate programs should do a lot better with sort of language education in requirements in, uh, and requirements because it I, is I would say. really yeah. important. Right. Um, now, we're like where did you find these? Like, were these documents all in Louisiana or did you have to travel to like France itself to actually find these sources? Some of, you know, some of it, I traveled to France, uh, which was wonderful. Oh yeah, um, Paris, several right? Trips. <laughs> yeah, several trips, but the Northern Coast. Uh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they call it? The Armored. Like Normandy? No, no, uh, north of that, the, uh, where all the corsairs. Oh, the Breton. Ah, and, um, so it, it's beautiful. So, mm -hmm. um, I spent some time at Nacional, and um, but there are a lot of sources here too. I mm -hmm. I found the interesting um, battle between two doctors. Mm -hmm. It says my internet connection is unstable, so I'll just cancel that out. But uh, <clears throat> these doctors, and they argued in French, they were like uh, a pre-Civil War, and uh, they continued after the Reconstruction. One of them was pro-slavery white supremacist, oh, and the other was yes. this great humanitarian and yellow fever mm -hmm. expert internationally. Yeah. Yeah. And so they went back, and it's all in French. Mm -hmm. And so um, it would be... You know, now again, I only scratch the surface, but right. that's one story. That's something that really fascinates my audiences is that mm -hmm. that um, dynamic that occurred uh, in the medical, mm -hmm. the influence of the French Revolution yeah. on the doctors here, because there were two particular, two famous doctors here. So there were many doctors here educated in France, but these two doctors, one was Afro Creole and the other one was white. And they were um, uh, allies, um, mm -hmm. both had interracial uh, practices, mm -hmm. and they were educated in the uh, medical school, the Faculty de Médecine Paris, in which students were taught that um, <clears throat> in order to cure patients, you must uh, first confront tyranny and slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that way you could then be able to cure the patient. And yeah. so that's a, a way of thinking that they brought home to, with them. Uh, the Afro Creole doctor was a medical student there with uh, his colleague, uh, Dr. Charles Faget. 
And uh, he experienced the 1848 revolution. He was at the barricades there before things fell apart in the 1848 revolution. But he was there and he thought he was convinced that if you can do it here, they abolished slavery during the 1848 revolution, abolished slavery, and they extended the uh, the franchise to the former slaves and, and men, all men of color so could vote, and they voted representatives into the uh, National Assembly. So D- Dr. Rudanet, Charles de Rudanet, was very impressed with that, and he believed that he could do the same thing here in Louisiana. After right. all, Louisiana at the time was the, uh, or I should say the United States was the largest slaveholding country in the world. Yeah. So, I mean, by the time that they were attending medical school, slavery was really coming under a greater and greater attack. So it was yeah. reasonable, it seems to me, to believe that, yeah, yeah, uh, slavery is going to fall apart in the United States too. Right. And that just shows, like, it, it kind of, like, I want to talk more about the doctors a little bit later, but mm-hmm. it, it felt like, one of the really engaging aspects of your book was that you found all of these personal stories and you kind of pursued some and you kind of teased out what they what they did, where they came from. Like, mm-hmm. like how important was it to you in, in the writing to to find and personalize this narrative as much as you could? Mm-hmm. It was wonderful. I mean, it's been a wonderful experience for me. Um, there was so much I didn't know. I didn't know. In fact, one of the, I don't know if I've mentioned this already, but one of the biggest revelations to me was the uh, migration of Haitians into New Orleans. They doubled mm. the size of the city in 1809 and 1810. And uh, so that was pretty amazing there. And then just a year later, there was the largest slave revolt just south of Louisiana. Uh, uh, And it uh, it was believed that it was led by a Haitian slave, a a slave from Haiti. Mm. So in those ways, the the, uh, revolution, the the Haitian revolution enormously impacted, uh, impacted the... Uh, city, for one thing, it uh, fortified the three caste racial order that existed in the city. Yeah, and uh, again, the largest slave revolt uh, in the in the uh, United States occurred there. Mm-hmm. And then in 1804 and 1815, uh, Haiti's refugee soldiers joined in the mm-hmm. city with other Atlantic world itinerant revolutionaries from the rest yeah. of revolutionary Europe, the French, the uh, the Spaniards uh, all fought, had fought in the uh, revolutionary upheavals. And so um, <clears throat> these itinerant revolutionaries uh, had aspirations for a new world order. And so um, that pitted them against Europe's power. So they came to fight the British in New Orleans, in the Battle of New Orleans. And then after that, um, <laughs> they moved. everywhere. Everywhere they moved, yeah. everywhere, and yeah. hundreds of uh, soldiers mm-hmm. from Haiti entered Louisiana uh, at the time of the <clears throat> at the time of these migrations around 1809, and uh, they were viewed as very dangerous people by mm-hmm. the planters, the white slave holding planters. And, and if so- I may intercede there because that group was really fascinating because you had like. I, I, I think it was the the Keene family where it's like they came, they lived in, in San Domingue, which was like Hades and, and then they go to Jamaica. Uh, mm-hmm. And then they, they come to, the Russians. yeah, then, and then they've come to New Orleans, to Louisiana, um, smuggled in through Lafitte's pirate network <laughs> and <laughs> then appear here and, assume a community leadership role and it's like part of me as i was reading this it was like how did you find this how did you find all of these details of like where they where they went how they stopped and like just lafitte like you would think like 
he's, he, he's engaging in illegal stuff. There wouldn't be records of it. How did you find all that? Um, well, uh, I used uh, a woman's history book. She mm-hmm. wrote a history, a memoir. Helene yeah. Dacoin Alain, and there's a lot. Her famous was ve- her family uh, was very f- influential in New Orleans, and they were influential in Saint Domingue as well. And so there were a lot of um, th- I could use different things to piece her, her life history together. And mm-hmm. her, um, so it, it was it was a matter of just finding, digging up, you know, different mm-hmm. aspects of her life. And then her life was like the. Um, the um, how do you say? It was the spine of this book, okay, yes. okay, because she linked all of these Everything. people. Yeah, yeah, she linked all of these people. So her and her book was a virtual roadmap of the revolutionary era in the city. And it was also fascinating, and I wonder if you can that you treat Alanis memoir or book however we want to define this very different from previous scholars because you point out that many previous individuals looking at the book were like extremely dismissive that they were like nah this is useless this is just Mm -hmm. some personal ramblings and you're you're giving it a lot of credit instead yeah um actually not all scholars looked at it that's true african american scholars were the first to seize on it Mm-hmm. And to point out the symbols, she discusses the dancing, the proverbs, the uh, character of the people. She, she describes some of them in great detail. An African woman was a member of the, the household uh, who fled the revolution, uh, right, their family. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and remained, they will remain life with them. And uh, a free woman of color from uh, actually New Orleans who was sent to here to help support the family. But again, there and there are fascinating uh, descriptions of these people, mm-hmm. and also the the culture uh, in the city. Uh, she described that you know Congo Square and the, the uh, how fascinated she was with the uh, the African peoples, mm-hmm. uh, the various. Uh, uh, peoples from uh, different uh, nations, African mm-hmm. nations. And uh, one thing she studies was Moreau de saint Murray. I don't know if you can know him, but he wrote a voluminous history of the Haitian Revolution right mm-hmm. on the eve, a voluminous history of Haiti, rather, of Saint-Domingue, I'm sorry, uh, a voluminous history of Saint-Domingue. Her family was in that history. And so mm-hmm. I found some information in there. Yeah. And uh, she studied it, and she read it, and she uh, copy 39 pages of that book into her own book mm-hmm. and it dealt with the uh, Africans and African uh, Creole uh, mm-hmm. folks and so um, it was like she saw in that in that book uh, New Orleans and all the different mm-hmm. African peoples and such and their uh, customs and their mm-hmm. religious practices too. Uh, so that was very interesting. The mesmerism, the um, the uh, mesmerism, spiritualism, different things uh, that were practiced, likewise pra- uh, practiced in Sandomag, uh, Haiti, mm-hmm. I should say. Haiti, Haiti. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Sandomag. And so uh, that's pretty interesting. And mm-hmm. um, so. African scholars, black scholars, like I mentioned, Charles, maybe I didn't, but he was an African scholar writing in 1930s. He published his first book. And in that, uh, <clears throat> he, you know, got a book and thought and remarked in uh, John Blassing. I don't know if you feel you, you might have a study. You want to take a look at that for sure. And um, <clears throat> so, um, African American scholars did know what she wrote and were very fascinated and overcame mm-hmm. the language uh, barrier because it's never translated, and so mm-hmm. overcame that barrier to uh, include her work in their studies. Yeah, yeah, and it it it, it was, I mean, as I already said it was very fascinating in in so many regards. And <laughs> what what 
what she had to tell and how like the family moved and evolved and intermarried and it 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 got to the point where you sometimes were like losing track of how much they were interacting and related to one another and where everyone mm -hmm. was and <laughs> it yeah it it seemed like that Santa Main based refugee community in Louisiana was a very close knit community uh, close knit group yeah. uh huh yeah they maintained their ties to their relatives in France mm -hmm. yeah. so they maintained their all the, all this network god parentage uh kinship ties Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, at least, at least one of the soldiers, I'm sure there were more, in the migration of the um, soldiers uh, into uh, Louisiana um, were related to the other soldiers. Right. <laughs> in the, right. in the, uh, so there was enormous interracial mixing, mixing in Saint-Domingue and in mm -hmm. New Orleans as well. And so there were all of these ties, ties in France, you know, so all mm -hmm. of these ties were maintained. And of course, as the Anglo-American influence took over with its very oppressive slave regime, mm -hmm. uh, that changed. Yeah. It became uh, uh, <laughs> it became unwelcome and mm -hmm. considered dangerous for you to be yeah. so closely tied, especially by uh, in a kinship relationship mm -hmm. uh, to the enslaved population. So, and there's it. It's you already mentioned it, but there's also a lot of interracial interactions that we're seeing within this community too, which in New Orleans was okay initially, but once the United States takes over and racial laws become more strict, mm -hmm. it becomes much more difficult to right. And you know that's an interesting point because one of the uh, refugees, the white refugee, I guess, I mean, who knows, but a white <laughs> refugee, he was he was accepted as white, he viewed himself mm -hmm. as white, but his name was Moral Islet, and what he did was to, uh, he was brilliant, he could speak all three languages, so he had that gift, and the that territorial gift, governor yeah. at the time of his entry recognized immediately that he was just the man he needed to sort out the legal system. Uh, mm -hmm. in Louisiana, because he could speak, to, it was just a babble of the different right. languages, civil law, mm -hmm. common law, Spanish, French, yeah. English. And so uh, Claiborne, the territorial governor of Louisiana, immediately hired him. Yeah. And so he drafted, he was the lead, uh, he was the lead architect mm -hmm. of the Louisiana Civil Code, the first Louisiana Civil Code. And he sorted out through all the languages and he blended the civil with the common. And so right. it came out very much like Claiborne liked it. Mm. But, and then Claiborne made him a judge. And that influential position allowed him to reinforce the three caste racial order. Okay. Mm. Right. And so that, that protected the free population of color to which many of the uh, refugees, to whom many of the ref mm -hmm. refugees were related and yeah. probably, possibly himself. Yeah. But um, it gave the free population of color the ability, uh, many of the rights of citizens, mm -hmm. uh, they could um, uh, 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 charge, they could, uh, um, how do you say it? Um, As a, uh, like bring lawsuits right and right bring lawsuits right yeah. and so that and acquire property mm -hmm. and so that by the time of the civil war louisiana's free population was by far the richest in the united states yeah so yeah. that was a very big you know they they could acquire and into contracts and acquire mm -hmm. property and uh uh make contracts testify in all sorts of cases even against mm -hmm. whites uh, so many of the rights of citizens uh, were accorded them by virtue of his his decision, right. and so that um, and I thought I thought that nothing was extended to the slave to the enslaved, but I'm beginning to think that that's probably not the case that he oh. that the Latin European some aspects of the Latin European laws uh, were adapted and also oh. benefited the slaves. So, That's a good research project for the future. Exactly. And in fact, so, I'm getting ready to the, go to the Louisiana Historical Association 
And the way that I'm learning about this is through these students, these three students yeah. who are investigating that topic. And I have some questions for them to see. Oh, um, where are that, they? Where do you, where do they study? At LSU or? Slavery. Oh. No, uh, you're, those three uh, students you're thinking about. I can't think off the top of my head, oh. you know, the, the, the yeah. conference is coming up in about a month yeah. or so. I was going to say, so, say hello to uh, like Mike Martin and Mary Farmer Kaiser if you run into them. They were they Mark Mike Martin was the kind of very influential person at University of Louisiana when I was oh, there. Okay. Yeah, okay. You, he he was the God, did he run the it's gonna be embarrassing being on tape saying this, but I think he ran the <laughs> he either ran a St Louisiana Study Center or the journal and organization for like a few years. No, I'll, um, I'll definitely, so, and, and that's at the university. Yeah. That's at life. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Let's sure. see. Were you at Lafayette then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I was. I, I was down there, not LSU. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was. I was Judy Dentry's student. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I know her. Yeah, she she's well known. <laughs> She was yeah. wonderful as an advisor. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 No, it, but um, I, I'm I will keep an eye on that. That sounds very interesting as a uh -huh. as a topic. But yeah. there's one thing, of course, where there was major change that you do mention quite a bit in in the book, and that was the militia law, and yes, the ability of military service for african american or afro-caribbean if you want in mm -hmm. the state uh -huh. yeah right um yes well there were hundreds of uh armed uh itinerant uh soldiers from saint domingue haiti who fought in the revolution in the haitian revolution who migrated into uh eventually into louisiana Mm -hmm. They weren't allowed. They were barred from entering. Right. So they entered, as you mentioned, surreptitiously. I don't know exactly how, probably Lafitte. Uh, That's a still fascinating migrated. aspect. Yeah, they migrated to Mexico where they fought in, They well, they set out on a number of expeditions to mm -hmm. Mexico to support Mexican independence. And in one instance, in a couple of instances, in fact, they were led by the French Revolutionary General, mm -hmm. uh, Yes, uh, uh, General Humbert. All connected. And, right. And um, they also, a number of them also joined with um, Louis, uh, the Corsair, the Jacobin Corsair, uh, uh -huh. Louis, uh, <clears throat> I hope I can't think of his name, uh, Louis Auré. Right. And uh, Auré had close contacts with the president of Haiti at that time. Who was Alexander Pichon? And yes. uh, Pichon and was, was offering, he, yeah, he's offering men in arms uh, to uh, uh, the the the, the uh, independence uh, mm -hmm. fighters if they would uh, uh, abolish slavery in the lands that they captured, and so that was the arrangement. And, you know, another fascinating subject that, that would be wonderful to explore. There's a lot of misinformation out there. But Louis Auré sailed mostly with black uh, sailors. Mm -hmm. And not only did he do that, but the ships that he was uh, a, a superb, he's written in all the Latin American history books, but not ours or anybody yep. else's, it appears. But he's very famous for assisting in uh, independence in, in Latin uh, America. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so that would be a wonderful subject. And he sailed with virtually all black crews. Mm -hmm. And if he, uh, uh, he recruited, in one instance that I could see, recruited, he stopped a slave ship and recruited right. them into, onto his ship and made them uh, sailors. And, um, and the, 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 uh, what interests, interests me most about all that is that the ships that they seized? He kept. He kept. They were captained by his lieutenants, who were black, oh, and so there yeah. was these black uh, sea captains with their black crews, and uh, 
and mm -hmm. Parotan Dumont has, uh, has studied him somewhat and called him the Jacobin Corsair with good reason. Right. And so I think that that would be a very, very wonderful. It, it's, I don't know if it can be done to get at right. the sources yeah. and such, but it would be a very worthwhile project. Yeah. <clears throat> and, but it, 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 part of what you're saying here too is that there's a fear of revolution that we're seeing eventually by like the 1820s, 1830s in all of the Americas that where is this going to lead us? Mm -hmm. um, these, you have African, Afro-Caribbean, African-American men and women who are rebelling like on ships, uh, on plantation economies to kind of gain their freedom. You have this whole new independence movement that tons of new states are appearing. So it, it, it you have this massive fear, right? That really in, co contributes to this perception of like, ooh, is it a good idea to keep um, African-American or Afro-Caribbean, whichever way we want to take this, men under arms in in Louisiana and uh -huh. it's sort of odd to see that when you consider that they were such a prominent force during the Battle of New Orleans yeah like, well they wanted to they wanted to be rewarded with citizenship yeah fighting in the Battle of New Orleans and Jackson said no and you can't be citizens and so they went off to find places where they could, but they came back. Some of them came back, of yeah. course, and remained there until, you know, and were buried there and buried here mm -hmm. uh, in New Orleans. And that's another project. I'd like to know where Joseph Savory, the head of all these men, was. These men mm -hmm. were very well armed and they doubtlessly were uniformed in uh, the uniforms of French soldiers. And the, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, so, <laughs> It would be interesting to study. Um, the uh, you mentioned that the 1834 the militia was ended, right? The black militia. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the legislature wanted to end that because it was considered so dangerous, and it was ended in 1834. But they just went underground with their guns and every other uh, because when the uh, when the uh, Civil War commenced, mm -hmm. uh, they They're were right invited back. to parade. They were invited to parade with the white. Yeah. Uh, soldiers and they had all these heavy arms that terrified mm -hmm. citizens and so they were uh uh let go you, right. um, they weren't invited um, they weren't invited back yeah and so they maintained their militia and uh i think that's how they that was an important uh protection for them and mm -hmm. absolutely and and not so much that they they knew it was a protection, but I think other people knew it was a protection too. Mm -hmm. The militias were ended in 1834, and that is exactly the year that their important ally, who got them into the Battle of New Orleans in the first place, uh, Charles Louis, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, um, Daquin, Louis yeah. Charles Daquin. It was his uh, pressure. That mm -hmm. got Jackson, and of course Jackson could see, you know, that they were he, they were recommended by other people to the, these soldiers who were so successful, mm -hmm. and so that uh, to that together with Savory's uh, recommendation, and in this struggle, the whites accused Savory of being black, and so the, of course that was <laughs> that was a very uh, but he he apparently it, it had no effect on him. He was well connected, yeah, yeah. and uh, so it just. See, appears to have rolled off his back, and he remained mm. successful. Yeah, and uh, when he died, that ended the militia, the, right. the free black militia. Yeah, uh, although again, they remained, they remained, uh, yeah, wedded yeah. to their arms and kind of like an interesting arms. underground movement to study, yes. like the rebelliousness, yes. but not outward so much right. rebellion. Right. right. But I also found fascinating that I, I forget when it was like. I think it was like 1835 or so, you said that Jackson comes back and he actually makes a point of meeting with those veterans of his who were African. Yes, yes. That's 1844. 
He was coming back. That for a decade. Uh, he was coming back. Jackson came back to visit friends. He made very good friends uh, in New Orleans. And he, uh, there was a, the monument, the Jackson, you know, the horse mm -hmm. Jackson, Jackson yeah. Square. Yeah. And so he came back for that. <clears throat> and yes, I mean, uh, men at arms appear to develop very strong ties with one yeah. another. Yeah. And so that was the case. And um, it, it, Jackson is described uh, as weeping at, the, mm. uh, at meeting them and this recollection of their, yeah. you know, their success. Right. I mean, yeah, his success at New Orleans. And uh, Savory, uh, well, Savory was dead by then, mm -hmm. but Savory um, was very important. Savory and Doc went together were very important to the success at the Battle of New Orleans. Yeah. So Jackson, I'm, I know, always appreciated that. I'm sure he did. Right. It, I, I mean, we don't want to go too far with Jackson. And like, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is sort of a brotherhood in arms. Exactly. That forged this exactly. because, I mean, Jackson is a slaveholder exactly. and does very yes. bad things towards Native Americans. But exactly. There are glimpses. And, and actually, you can read that back in history because uh, the Savory family and the Daquan family mm -hmm. were closely allied in Saint Domingue. Right. And if you look at the population distribution, I mean, 90% of the population in Saint Domingue was African. Yeah. And so that these uh Daquin and Alain, they formed uh, a fellowship there as well, right. given what they were facing in, in uh, Saint Domingue. Yeah, yeah. The hardships that they had to overcome. Um let's see here. I let's <clears throat> Let's pivot over because you already mentioned them, and I do want to talk a little bit about um, the graduates from Paris, Paris Medical because I thought, oh, yeah. thought that was just, again, like the whole, like everything about it, I, I have to admit, I was not, history of medicine is not in my area. I have not read much about it, but it was just fascinating to have these French educated doctors who see equality in France they're not treated differently over there yes yeah come right. back and like do like phenomenal things to improve a lot of everyone mm -hmm. in the city mm -hmm. or in the region I should say mm -hmm. yes right yeah um yeah it's amazing um Dr. Faget, in addition to his work in Yellow Fever, which was amazing, and again, he was internationally recognized for that, um, was also introduced uh, anesthetic into labor, uh, women's mm -hmm. labor room. Uh, yeah. At that time, uh, women couldn't even be, uh, maybe a little bit earlier than 18, the mid-1840s, but women couldn't be examined by male doctors. And so women were a <laughs> in France, in France, <laughs> in France, of course, that that was done, and so right. they had a, a very uh, considerable understanding about delivery and delivering yeah. babies and, and C sections and things like that. That was interesting to me too. Yeah, in fact, like, I'd like to do more in, along those lines. But yeah, so he was Dr. Fage was just a phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, uh, introducing again. I said anesthesia into the delivery room and. Uh, finding uh, di diagnostic tools to determine if someone mm -hmm. had yellow fever or mm -hmm. maybe they had cholera. And so he developed a, uh, a way of determining, and that's very important to be able to diagnose mm -hmm. that yellow fever, because um, if you treated someone with cholera, you thought they had yellow fever and they had something else, typhus mm -hmm. maybe or something, then you could kill them with the treatment. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, that was an important development. So, but uh, he didn't find a um, he didn't find a, the ultimate weapon against right. yellow fever. Yeah. But it, he was part of the process of uh, mm -hmm. the work that went into diagnosis and uh, and treatment. He had some success uh, in treatment. So, uh, 
But he didn't think. He thought the only way you can survive yellow fever is to get it and survive. And if you right, survive, immunization, sort of. Right. Yeah. So, but Dr. Uh, Rudine, his uh, his colleague in all of this, was equally extraordinary mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that he campaigned and persisted and never let go. Always. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, his dream of seeing slavery abolished, as in the 1848 revolution, which he witnessed, mm -hmm. and also of uh, seeing uh, African-Americans uh, mm -hmm. exercise citizenship rights, the right to vote, and to be part, not to be citizens in a democratic republic. So, yeah. And, yeah. But the other part that I found extremely interesting was, was the medical material of yours was uh, that like in in part we'll, we'll try to go back to it in a, a when we get to the civil war in a minute but just this like the yellow fever and like benjamin butler becomes sort of the savior <laughs> and the, the fixer of it but you also have um I, i'm gonna try and see if I, where I have it in my notes but it's sort of like there was sort of a conversation where your French educated doctor was like no the science says this is what happens this is how we treat it and then mm -hmm. you have this other doctor who's saying like exactly. no don't, don't believe that that's that's total bogus yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's that... like, it felt so much when yeah. I read that like the whole thing about the COVID pandemic and people are like yes, yes no no yes. no that, no that don't believe the doctors the doctors yeah. are totally yeah. wrong and the doctors are like right trust us yeah um that that was dr jellery who was practicing a uh awful form of medicine uh which was based on white supremacy yeah. and it was really malfeasance in uh, medicine <laughs> and uh he and dr fage argued for decades here mm. over yellow fever and the proper treatment and things like that that is uh it was all in french Dr. Mm -hmm. Fage spoke only French. Yeah. And so uh, some of his colleagues would translate his work so that other the Anglophone doctors could read it. But um, Dr. Delery had no interest whatsoever. I mean, they were at loggerheads. I mean, they would fought uh, bitterly. Um, at one point, uh, Dr. Delery challenged Dr. Fage to a duel. But Dr. Uh, Fage was uh, a devout Catholic. And he, I can't do that. You know, it's against my, my morals to, to do that. But they fought bitterly before the Civil War, and they fought bitterly after the Civil War. Right. And there's a whole, um, I don't know if anybody would want to do it, but these guys, Dr. Delery and his allies, wrote these horrible attacks on the Re Reconstruction government. Mm -hmm. and, uh, terrible, terrible attacks, and uh, no one's ever uh, uh, tapped into those. or. Uh, mm, that sounds or, like... Uh, and utilize them you know but but they're so awful i mean they're right. really terrible they attack butler and yeah. uh, all of the top uh, black leadership uh, in the city so yeah you know it's it, it feels like we're offering grad students a lot of ideas of what to study in the future <laughs> of like what, <laughs> yeah. what's untapped material that if you speak I a mean, little it's, french it's wonderful wow. yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. and it's like you know when like I, I remember my a professor colleague of mine in middle Georgia who was like, everything has been told about the Civil War. Oh. <laughs> we all looked at him every time and we're like, no, not really, Bob, but whatever. <laughs> but it's like, this is exactly right. There's so many facets and stories that we still uh -huh. haven't and we don't understand quite yet. Right. That, the other the different. other thing that Dr. Faget did was to practice interracial medicine. Yeah. And so that he that. treated the, the nuns, the, the uh Haitian mm -hmm. uh uh domain, the Haitian Revolution's uh um refugees, mm -hmm. some women formed a black convent uh, in New yeah. Orleans. And uh that was Dr. Rudin's uh one of his charities. He devoted himself mm -hmm. to that and helped to found the order of nuns. And Fage treated them, and so that he was their doctor. And then, when the first, they were the second order of black nuns to establish themselves uh, in the United States. And when the first representatives of the first order of black nuns, who were also Haitian, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. uh, visited New Orleans uh, and during Reconstruction, Dr. Fage treated them during a yellow fever epidemic, and he they recovered. Yeah. So um, one of the big things, one of the major things that I discovered in my study that I didn't know before is the enormous impact of Haitian, of mm-hmm. Saint-Domingue, Haitian, that migrations. Yeah. Uh, it was just uh, enormously important. So uh, that, and I didn't realize it until like the end. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm talking about all of these refugees, white mm-hmm. and black and from the Haitian Revolution, and uh, uh, okay, I mean, it just dawned yeah. on how enormously important they've been, and not only <laughs> during the uh, revolutionary years and re- uh, mm-hmm. Civil War and all of that, but up until the present, right. because um, in 2022, uh, the a descendant of Homer Plessy. Do you know who mm. Homer Plessy is? Yep, and yep, yep. Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme <laughs> Boy, Court. I hope all my listeners know. <laughs> in uh, 1896, who uh, uh, declared a Louisiana law valid, the Plessy versus yeah. Ferguson case, which segregated uh, persons on railway cars. And so the person who was uh, 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 um, uh, recruited Mm-hmm. To challenge this law was Homer Plessy. So that's how the Supreme Court decided. He was of uh, uh, Haitian ancestry as well. Oh. Uh, and so... Um, Once you start looking, they suddenly appear everywhere, I'm telling you, don't they? Yeah. And then uh, the... Yeah. In 2022, a descendant of his, Keith Plessy, mm-hmm. uh, worked to have his... He was fined, Homer Plessy in... Uh, 1790 was fined twenty five dollars for violating the separate call law. So what Homer Plessy did just recently here in a very moving ceremony was to uh, have that uh, penalty overturned. In mm-hmm. other words, his, his uh, right, his uh, the law under which he had been or the penalty that he had suffered was uh, yeah. removed from his nice. uh, name. Yeah, so we're, we're very a long moving. way still towards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, writing some and, of the wrongs done. Yes, and not only that, but uh, the the attorneys that fought through after um, after yeah. uh, nineteen hundred, the attorneys that fought uh, the um, that fought segregation and inequality in mm-hmm. Japan and all of that was A. P. Turo and his young son, uh, uh, G- A. P. Turo Jr. desegregated LSU. In oh. the, uh, yeah, in the 1950s, well, he segregated very young, a very traumatic yeah. experience. I mean, at that time, still. Yeah. So, um, um, I'm still waiting for LSU to put a building named after Sherman up. So, <laughs> do I? <laughs> I'm still waiting on LSU to put up a building named after William T. Sherman. So, until that happens, I'm not going <laughs> to give him too much credit oh, yet. <laughs> there has been a building named after Turo, AP Turo. Yeah. And they uh-huh. should. In fact, I'm getting ready to go to a ceremony for uh, whereby his son is turning over documents of the family. Oh, uh, to Yeah. Nice. So I'm really looking forward to that. I hope they don't that. store that on that leaky floor of theirs. <laughs> I hope so, too. Surely. Yeah, that, that would be bad. Um, <laughs> let's see here. I'm... Let's talk briefly about Butler. I, I, I we're, oh, wow. we're just going to talk bri- like briefly about Butler with regard okay. to because I, I found Butler <laughs> is such a lightning rod of of a person because I, I have I had oh now I'm going to blank on her name. Um, she's going to hate me for it, but I I had an interview with the author of his most recent biography. I recently talked with somebody and they were very anti-Butler with sort of the first weeks of the Civil War. And now I have you who also likes has Butler in it. And like Butler seems like he he appears, if you look closely, if you study the right areas, he's everywhere. (laughs) But Butler for you has sort of a couple of really important contributions. Oh, yes. And yeah. I'm just going to let you pick, like, what what do you think are the, for your stories, the two most important contributions that 
Butler makes with regard to New Orleans? Okay, well, he did a lot. Dr. Rudene, Dr. Charles Rudene, educated at the Faculty of Medicine de Paris, huh? who had seen the 1848 revolution, um, he started a newspaper, and he, as soon as uh, and Butler gave him a subsidy for it, and it, it maintained that slavery needed to be abolished, and slavery gave him another subsidy later on uh, to support the newspaper and his agenda, very radical agenda. And what uh, Rudene wanted was a revolution, and I see Butler as assisting him to the extent that he could in achieving that revolution. I think one of the most interesting things for me for me, is that enslaved New Orleanians turned up immediately at his encampment mm -hmm. once he occupied the city. And they, uh, Butler listened to them. Mm -hmm. And so that before long, he had eyes and ears in every household in the city. And so mm -hmm. they were his informants. Mm -hmm. And then he established a perimeter around the city to keep the to keep the city stable to the extent that he could mm -hmm. and to keep the rural workers uh, out and everybody, just the perimeter. But black enslaved men fought their way into the city and he made the decision, well, if they're gonna try to fight us, we'll put them in the US Army so they can fight the enemy. Yeah. And so he recruited like 2000 men. And remind you, he was only there nine months, okay? He did extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he recruited free and enslaved soldiers into three regiments mm -hmm. and he named 76 commissioned officers Consider in the country commission to African American soldiers in recruitment, uh, you know, uh, commission soldiers, a black United States Army, the United States, uh, you know, had recruited just to the army. So, uh, what he did, he can. Uh, considered his uh, considered revolution. Uh, totally, totally, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and of course, uh, he's subsidizing this new abolitionist newspaper, <laughs> really. So, uh, that made President Lincoln very anxious about what mm -hmm. he was doing. <laughs> he was having success with his black soldiers in the West uh, part of region mm -hmm. there was um a blockade run the united states attempted to block the and so what they did was send his soldiers and black soldiers over there to stop yeah. that they were successful yeah so yeah. uh we don't hear about that though we it seems to me so often although there are two books about butler uh, Bulldozing mm -hmm. is one of them by Adam Fairpool. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that book. Yeah. And another yeah. one by a, a woman scholar, and I can't think of the name of her book. Yes, I In know. In any event, <laughs> they, they're, they're revisionists, okay? They're mm -hmm. revisionists. So, um, yeah, really a very interesting. And he never forgot African Americans. He had medals coined for the soldiers that distinguished themselves. He was in Congress. And you know, supported legislation that favored uh, Americans. Right. He was an extraordinary man, and uh, but uh, I like that office. Six of the office, six of the officers were commissioned. Hundred, the total yeah. number of black commissions officers. I find that extraordinary. Yes. <clears throat> now I'm going to redeem myself. Elizabeth Leonard, <clears throat> Benjamin Butler's. Uh, biographies that we were both thinking about. Yes. Uh, but uh, in your few, the uh, go ahead. Is it Elizabeth Leonhardt for the a noisy, fearless life? That was what she termed Butler's <laughs> subtitled her book about Butler. Oh, uh, but yeah. And it's it, it again, it's such a fascinating like there. I'm going to let people read that section in your book because there's so many interesting facets and stories. But to get to, as we're drawing towards the end here, I want to kind of pull back a little bit and look at your title one more time because you you call it the Revolutionary Atlantic, and mm -hmm. so many studies about the age of revolutions are like. Yes, we start with the American Revolution in about 1770, 
1826, but we're going to end around 1825 when Spanish America gets its independence. And you're saying let's, and then there's been some challenge to say like, well, maybe 1848 could be a good end point too, but you're going to the 1870s to say, let's, let's really go like towards the end of reconstruction. Uh, Mm -hmm. So question being, how do you see reconstruction as sort of that culmination, I guess, of this age of revolution? Yes, I do. Um, and that's because during Reconstruction, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> fully half of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention uh, were Black. Mm-hmm. And one third of the members of Representative were Black in Reconstruction. Mm-hmm. The state treasurer of Reconstruction or during the Reconstruction period was uh, black. Mm-hmm. And uh, the lieutenant governor, who served as governor, Oscar Dunn, that, that's a brand new uh, so was black. And a close mm-hmm. ally of Ulysses Grant, you know that. So this new Jets, oh, that is uh, Brian Mitchell is um, monumental is the title of the book. And so there were all of the extraordinary gains mm-hmm. and nowhere else in the 19th century Western sphere did African Americans achieve genuine political power mm-hmm. except post-revolutionary Okay? Right. So, in that sense, I would say that I am justified in considering their gains a revolutionary there's other things in their situation. You were, were an oath of office to accept uh, to accept the civil equality of all men, mm-hmm. uh, all citizens, equal access in places of accommodation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Orleans was the only city <clears throat> to desegregate public schools, which seven years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they established an interracial metropolitan police uh, force. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1869, they had charged at university, which is present colored, and in uh, and in middle school as well. Mm-hmm. And it was run by none other than Dr. Charles Louis Benet, uh, the famous Dr. Benet. She trained at the uh, Paris the Fep- Marison, Marison de Paris. So, mm-hmm. at which he passed on his, his thinking and his way of treating patients huh, to his students. Mm-hmm. So, I think that that's qualifies, you know, I think that that mm-hmm. qualifies all of these things uh, can be considered revolutionary and were perceived as, a, and the mm-hmm. most important thing was the Black New Orleanians saw mm-hmm. the Civil War as an opportunity. And four million men, women, and children liberated from slavery. I mean, all of, when you take, when you look at the large picture here, I know that there, there would, I, uh, that there is a objection to considering, yeah, to considering all of this uh, revolutionary. But I'm hoping to, to that I'll change that 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 view because I don't think it's uh, proper in this <clears throat> or applies rather to uh, New, Louisiana. Let's right. say no, and I, I think you're you're laying out an excellent case to kind of say that we have these individuals from Haiti who are coming to Louisiana. And they're wanting to bring more change to the territory. And Reconstruction, I always think of as sort of that that great moment of hope, right? Of that maybe we get racial equality, maybe we can achieve like a, a better society. And in the end, it doesn't last. But there is right. that brief moment where you have that hope and that moment where you have that opportunity and individuals who have been at the forefront of all of these changes are at the yes. forefront of this one as well. Right. Well, it, yeah, of course, then you have to take into account the terrible violence, right, that ensued. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were repeated street, street battles, terrible yeah. massacres, 
And so uh, at one point, Oscar Dunn, the lieutenant governor, uh, wondered if he should encourage his supporters to vote yeah. because the violence was so terrible. And uh, mm -hmm. both Dr. Faget and Dr. Rudin, they sent their cities, their families rather, uh, Dr. Rudenay sent his family to France and Dr. Faget his family to, to California because uh, it was, things were so terrible in yeah. the city. Yeah. And it's, it's still an aspect that like reconstruction needs still a lot of work with regard to just, just like just New Orleans, like the Battle of Liberty Place and the, the fighting there that we need a lot yeah. more kind of understanding of what how it fits sort of the larger narratives of kind of this revolutionary change. Right. And of course, just like to, well, not just like today, but very much it, re it reminds me of today, these Supreme Court decisions mm -hmm. that uh, turned the protection of yeah. rights back to the states to, to mm -hmm. rebel governments because they took over in New Orleans. Yeah. And the Kirkshank, kind of the 86 Kirk, Kirkshank division, uh, decision rather, in which no 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 white person could be punished for killing a black, uh, uh, a, a, a killing a black. So it gave a green light to acts of terrorism, mm -hmm. and the eighteen seventy seven removal of uh, federal troops from New Orleans, yeah. which was the state capital, resulted in a coup d'état. The final du, du, coup. There were many attempts, uh, many yeah. coup d'état attempts, but the the one in eighteen seventy was uh, the one that ended it all. So yeah. that wasn't that wasn't a Supreme Court decision, but anyway, it was a, all of these other uh, Supreme Court decisions yeah. led to uh, uh, to yeah, pro Confederate the, uh, pro Confederate uh, folks. Yeah, and I guess in the end, one of the big takeaways from your book had got to be that how. How fragile democracy is, and how important yes. it is to defend that democracy yes. Uh, yes. and the political achievements that we have yes. made. Yes. So. Right. Yep. Um, absolutely. At this stage, um, Karen, it was a great pleasure to have you today. Uh, again, thank you for interrupting your Mardi Gras celebrations <laughs> thank you um, it's been a real pleasure for me too thank you so much it, it's if you're interested in the book for my listeners it's creole new orleans in the revolutionary atlantic 1775 to 1877 it is available at lsu press and other places as well if you're watching the video karen has held, held up a book copy beautiful of cover. It. it's a beautiful cover actually i'll put that into my thumbnail for the episode as well okay. um, with that Karen thank you so much thank you